And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed. Neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. title of our sermon is The God Who Delivers. The emphasis in this text, in this portion of chapter 3, is not on the deliverance, nor is it on the emphasis on those who are delivered. The emphasis in this text, what is accentuated is the deliverer, the God himself who delivers. You see that, for example, in verse 28 and 29, where it speaks of blessed be the God who hath delivered his servants. And again in verse uh, 29, speaking of the God uh, that, hath, that can deliver after this sort. It is the Lord, it is Jehovah who has center stage in this passage. Our eyes are fixed, riveted upon Jehovah, upon the Lord himself. We, like his servants of old, are invited this evening to think and reflect, to meditate, to have our hearts raised heavenward, to behold our God as a deliverer. The God who brought down the walls of Jericho, as we heard on Sabbath afternoon, is the God who brought out his servants from this burning, fiery furnace. It's interesting, isn't it? Because these three servants, they could have had a quick, abbreviated exit. They could have been taken, as it were, immediately to their eternal inheritance. This could have been their day of martyrdom, their day of entrance into the glory of heaven. But instead they are sent back out into the wide world. The Lord had more work for them to do, more work on behalf of Jehovah. And so let's consider together uh, this passage. Three things. First of all, we see the miracle. The miracle itself is described in verses 26 and 27. The miracle. This king who had basically salvated, who was so eager to see in his fury these three godly men thrown into the furnace, thrust into the fire, is now equally eager to fetch them out. And so he himself goes to the mouth of the furnace and cries out into this burning, fiery furnace to these three men and says, come out, come hither. In essence, he's saying, I have got to see this. I've got to see this. I cannot believe what I am seeing. Notice that these three men went into the fire as criminals but they come out described, quote, as the servants of the Most High God. They went in as condemned criminals. But the, as they come out, they're identified with Jehovah. 
They're identified with the Lord himself. This is a high title. Servants of the Most High God. This is a sweet privilege and ought to remain such in our own hearts and minds. We ought to live as God's people. We ought to be, live so as to be seen as Christians. And when seen as Christians, we ought to prize it as a sweet privilege. For those who recognize us and say, this one, whether young or old, this one is a servant of the Most High God, is a Christian. We ought to live in such a way that we are identified with Christ himself. Because what's happening? These three men serve as pointers to God. They're like three little arrows walking around, and they're pointing heavenward. They're pointing to the Lord. Now, we, we, we've heard described the idol that Nebuchadnezzar has created, and it's colossal. It is this gigantic, golden idol raised on a plane. Everything about it is intended to loom large, for the shadow to be cast wide and long, for it to be dazzling and brilliant. It would have been thought of as a colossal, giant, tall statue. But now it is viewed as lowly trifle in comparison. He speaks of the most high God. Far more high than the idol that he had erected. You know what's more precious though? What's more precious than the fact that they're identified with God? What's more precious is that God is pleased to be identified with them. That's even sweeter. The fact that God is willing to be identified with you, Christian, to put his own name upon you, to baptize you into his name, to take you into union with the Lord Jesus, to say this is an adopted son or daughter of my house, to own us and to defend us, and to be attached to us. We ought to be saying to ourselves, how can it be that God would stoop this low to take to himself, as it were, the, the dust of the earth and to put his own name upon it and to say, I, the great, the most high God, am identified with these souls. That's exactly what's happening here. Notice that in verse 26, this miracle is described in terms of them coming out of the midst of the fire. That's what the text says. They come out of the midst of the fire. In other words, the fire is unabated. God didn't extinguish the fire. As part of the miracle, God could have and blown the fire out. But he left the fire ablaze. And they walk out of the midst of this fire just as surely as they had been thrown into the midst of the fire, the text already told us that they were walking around with the fourth, the one who was like unto the Son of God in the midst of the fire. So just as surely they walk out of the midst of the fire. What does this do? It makes it a conspicuous miracle. The fire is still ablaze when they come out of it. Now there are several things here I think that we need to press home. These men went headlong into this furnace. The fact is that we as Christians are often more concerned about our comforts than we are God's kingdom. Whether it's our afflictions or our deliverance from those afflictions. We at times prize our own comforts more than God's kingdom. What will serve the kingdom? In this case, being cast into the fire. In this case, being brought out of the fire. All of it served for the advance of God's kingdom. And sometimes, as we saw last, last time, sometimes the sweetest fellowship that we have with the Lord is in the midst of the fire. The fourth is with them in the midst of the fire. But sometimes the sweetest fellowship is given to us when we have a little bit of reprieve or relief from 
those afflictions. Sometimes that's when the sweetest fellowship is to be had. In fact, there are times when the affliction is so acute that we are perhaps physically unable to enjoy, as we would like, the fellowship with the Lord. And we may even plead, Lord, grant that I would have a measure of deliverance in order that I might have sweeter fellowship with you. But even then, we have to ask ourselves, because we are we, the, the subtleties of sin stick so fast to us, and here we're really pulling back the layers. In those cases, when we're saying, Lord, give relief in order that I might have fellowship, is it because it has to do with more with our experience of that fellowship than it does the glory of God? We need to be reminded that we exist. We exist for God's glory in all states. Some of these are deep things, and they're also delicate things that I'm describing, and they need to be covered with biblical balance. I'm very well, well aware of that. But the point is this, and this much is simple enough. It is not all about us. Our trials and afflictions are not all about us. The Lord has bigger, far more extensive things that he's working, many of which we will never see this side of eternity. And it calls us to trust him in the midst of that, even when perhaps we're not able to taste the sweetness in the midst of them. It also reminds us, as one person has aptly said, if you are irritated every time you're rubbed, how will you ever be polished? The Lord has his way of buffing us for his glory. Further evidence and interest about this miracle is brought out in verse 27. We see that it's a compre this miracle brought with it a comprehensive deliverance. The Lord had promised this to his people before they ever got into exile. He told them in Isaiah 43, verse 2, as I think I've quoted already in a previous sermon, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the, the, the flame kindle upon thee. So here we have, years later, the fulfillment of God's promises in these particular men. And it astonishes both king and crowd. Both king and crowd are astonished. Why? Because as the text says, the, the fire has no power. No power upon these men. And the proof that it has no power is threefold. We're told that not a hair on their head is singed. You know how easily hair burns. You get it anywhere near the flame of a candle, and whoosh, there it goes. Not a hair on their head is singed. None of their garments, which are highly combustible, are changed at all. And not even a whiff of smoke or the scent of smoke is sticking to them. These are proof of the comprehensive deliverance that God has brought. Children, you know what this means. When you go to a campfire, just standing around the campfire, not in the campfire as they have been, but just standing around it, makes you smell like smoke. You can go off and you smell like the campfire. Or your brother or sister do when they come back from standing around it. You see the point here. The Lord has taken great, gone to great extents to show his power. God's power over the fire's power. Now, the Chaldeans worshipped fire, and so God is stamping all over their God. He's triumphing over their God. His power is over the fire's power. And the point that's being brought to the fore here of, in this miracle is that God is able. God is indeed able, just as they had told Nebuchadnezzar before they went into the fire, so he has proved himself able to deliver his people. Jesus says, Later on in Luke 21, verse 18, 
but there shall not a hair of your head perish. He's saying, verse 17, ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. They'll hate you because of your allegiance to Christ. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. You see the continuity here in God's word. This is a public miracle, just as the the chief priests in Acts 4 look upon the miracle that had been done through Peter and John, and they say, well, we have to admit, the whole world can see that a great miracle has been done here. The greatest miracle of all was the resurrection, which was not, no one was able to contradict at the time, and the greatest thinkers, unbelieving thinkers to the present day have been unable to disprove or discount the resurrection. And so we see this miracle. Secondly, though, we come to the magnifying of God in verse 28. Secondly, the magnifying of God. God is glorified. Not Shadrach, not Meshach, not Abednego, but it is Jehovah that 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 is glorified. And no doubt these people are scratching their heads and saying, this is the God who has inspired such devotion from these servants. Now you can compare. On the one hand, you have Nebuchadnezzar's God, his idol, which glorified Nebuchadnezzar. It served his own glory. And then we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, and he glorified himself. Glorified, they glorified him, rather than in Nebuchadnezzar's case, his God glorifying him. They're glorifying God. It is his glory that stands at the front. You see his power, which is brought out, his power to deliver those who trust in him. Interesting, our our translation actually gives a literal rending when it says that they changed the king's word. God had power enabling them to change the king's word. The meaning is, They frustrated the king's word. Or they poured contempt on the king's decree. Or perhaps best of all, they reduced the king's decree to nothing. They they overthrew it. God had the power to change the king's word. Notice how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are described. First, they're described as this way, they trusted in him. They're described as trusting in Jehovah. Secondly, they're described as in terms of yielding their bodies. And then thirdly, they're described as being unwilling. They would not serve any other God except this living and true God. So they're described in terms of faith. They're described in terms of yielding their bodies, submitting themselves. And then thirdly, this devotion. Uh, to, to Jehovah. They would not serve, in terms of the second commandment, any other God except the living and true God. And so what's happening? God is glorifying his power. He can protect his people against everything, all of their malignant enemies, and everything else, even the creative power and destructive power of fire. You see his power. God is also glorifying his goodness. Nebuchadnezzar recognizes it's God who sent, in his words, his angel to them. This is the goodness of God stooping. And so his goodness is being glorified. All, Nebuchadnezzar is being faced with the power of God as well as the goodness of God held linked together. This would have been proof to Nebuchadnezzar of something very fundamental. Listen to me. It would have been proof to Nebuchadnezzar that his ability to bring Israel into captivity had nothing to do with his own power. It had everything to do with Israel's sin. The only reason Nebuchadnezzar had them in his hand is because of Israel's sin, not because of his own power, because they're serving a God who is both powerful and good and thus able to keep and deliver his people out of anyone's hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in their faith, in their yielding of their bodies, in their devotion to the Lord, prefer their soul to their bodies. They see the value of their soul. 
What shall I give in exchange for my soul? Not the whole world. They're living upon the, the praise of God rather than the praise of men. And they say, as I reinforced very strongly last time, they say to themselves, God's glory is worth suffering and dying for. His glory is that weighty that to yield my body to flames to preserve his glory is a very small price. You see, they have a steadfast faith. Nebuchadnezzar said they trusted in him. And that steadfast faith brings, ba brings about a steadfast faithfulness to God. They're seeing the Lord. They're occupied with him. And it gives them deep roots in God's word and his promises and enables them to thus do great things for his name and for his glory. And you think of the widespread benefit that this brought to their fellow believers. Can you imagine? what? First of all, their example would have strengthened the weak faith of their brethren. There were many of their brethren who were perhaps going, should I bow, should I not bow, should I bow, should I not bow, I don't know, can I trust the Lord or not? Would have strengthened their faith. There would have been those who did bow, who would have been rebuked through their example and brought to repentance and said, this is the living and true God, and I should and will give myself to, and service to him. It would have cured them of their idolatry, perhaps, under the blessing of God. And there are many other ways. Because of what they've done, they have provided safety for the rest of the Jews. He's saying, no one's allowed to speak against the, 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 the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That means that all of the Jews now have a providential provision that enables them to worship freely, openly, conspicuously, joyfully, publicly, fervently. They can serve the Lord under protection. Do you see? I could multiply all of the benefits given to the whole of God's people through God working through three small believers. Who can count the way that God is using Christian the work that he's doing in your soul, the work that he's begun in perfecting, just as the trial's not all about you, the blessings may extend so far beyond you that you could never trace them. You would never be able to find them, to count them, to be able to gather them to one place. There's a multitude of them. God is working in you Prophet is people. Here a testimony is being raised and spread throughout the empire. God is being magnified before the heathen. The Chaldeans and beyond the borders of Babylon, the word would have spread wide and far, countless thousands, hundreds of thousands perhaps, perhaps far more than hundreds of thousands, would have been brought this testimony that was magnifying Jehovah. God is the one who's occupying center stage. What Nebuchadnezzar sought, Christ gets. Christ is making a lasting name for himself. And Christ is uniting nations and tribes and tongues and languages of people under his kingdom, under his tent. What every despot and tyrant in the history of the world, Nebuchadnezzar, the pharaohs, the Roman emperors, to the present day administration in America and Britain and everywhere else in the world, once they shall not have, but Jehovah will. Christ's kingdom, Christ's name, Christ's glory. And even his enemies, like Nebuchadnezzar, will be forced to acknowledge the greatness of Christ, either now or later. All will pay homage to him. Before we pass, let me, a couple other points of application. They yielded their bodies. This, this is language that's used in the New Testament in Romans 12. Similarly, where it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You are being invited to trust in the Lord and to yield or present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not just a dying sacrifice cast into flames, but a daily sacrifice alive for the Lord. Your body, your eyes, your ears, your mouths, your feet, your hands, your minds, your strength, your body, not just your soul is to be devoted to him. You will set no wicked thing before your eyes. You will not listen to that which blasphemes Jehovah. You will speak words that edify and build up and are seasoned with grace. Your feet and hands will serve him. What strength God gives you in this life will be devoted to him so that your body is devoted to him as theirs was to Jehovah. Your members, the members of your body, are to be members of righteousness, Paul says. Why? Because your body has been brought into union with Christ, not just your soul. Your whole person, if you're a Christian, is brought into union with Christ, including your body, which is why when you die, your body rests in the grave, as our catechism says, still united to Christ even in death and therefore resurrected in the end by the power of Christ. Paul takes the theology that lies behind this point and presses it home. I mean, we can say from this text, they would not use their physical body to physically bow before an idol because it would belong to Jehovah. This body can't bow to an idol. It belongs to Jehovah. It has to go into the flames rather than bow to the idol. Paul takes that with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6 and he says, how can you, Christian, be joined to a harlot? And he says, and I've brought this out elsewhere, can Christ be joined to a harlot? You who are in union with Christ are joining a body that is in union with Christ to a harlot. You're dragging Christ into this immorality, as it were. You see the implications. It's the same theological foundation upon which Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were operating. Your body belongs, as well as your soul, to Jehovah. And it cannot bow to idols, and it cannot be employed in the service of any save Jehovah. Lastly, under this point, it, you are called upon to give devotion to Christ at all costs. The word all is underlined in my notes. Devotion to Christ at all costs. There is no price tag for the Christian. You cannot be bought. The things of this world, the idols of this world, money, prestige, power, name, everything else the world has to offer is absolute trash. You can't be bought with such things. Devotion to Jesus is to be at all costs. Thirdly, we see, and this is lastly, the mandate. Verses 29 and 30. The mandate, the king's mandate. Interesting, isn't it, that the chapter began with the decree to destroy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego for worshiping God. And the chapter ends with a decree to destroy anyone who speaks against the, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Whew. You want to talk about an about face. Contrast the beginning and the end of the chapter. It's the same king. And when I say same, I mean same king. This is a spiritually unaltered king. This is the same king in the same spiritual condition. And let, let me speak to that. He exemplifies a superficial, temporary, 
religious impression that is not saving. We've seen him do this before, and we're seeing him do it again. He looks and sounds a little bit like a believer, but he's not. He's devoid of both faith and repentance and perseverance and a whole host of other things. Nebuchadnezzar is impressed by power. He's impressed by the miraculous. Just as the Jews said, show us a sign. And many of them followed around because they wanted to see these miracles Jesus was doing. Just as people came to Whitfield and listened to him preach on the shores of our colonial America, people like Ben Franklin showed up because they were wowed by the demonstration of divine power in the preaching of Whitfield but were entirely unaffected spiritually by that preaching. They didn't repent and believe under it. It's the same story over and over. They're interested. He's interested in the power of God, not in the promises of God. The, king, the king's word has been frustrated, we're told, but the king did not trust in God's word. He did not turn to Jehovah's word. He would not have been impressed with the foolishness of the cross, for example, with the weakness of the cross. He's not humbled, as it were, by his need of grace. He's not brought broken before the Lord as a pauper, saying, I need grace. Tell me about a mediator and savior. Point me in the direction of the deliverer. Help me to be delivered from my sin. There's no faith here. He speaks of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He does not speak of my God. He does not speak of the God of Nebuchadnezzar. He speaks of him, as it were, in the third person, their God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so it is today. There are many who, who are in, whose impressions under gospel preaching are skin deep. Their impressions under gospel preaching are skin deep. They listen to it, and they can feel something of the power in the preaching of God's word. And they see the truthfulness of it. And they see how compelling it is. And they see how unreasonable sin and unbelief is. And they can, they can as it were, look from a distance. But their heart remains hardened. Seeing the truth is very different from submitting to the truth. My question is this, did the idol still stand on the plain of Dura? That's what I want to know. Did the idol still stand on the plain of Dura? True repentance on Nebuchadnezzar's part would have been destroying that idol, grinding it, burning it, and dumping it into the river. Not in promoting God's servants. Repentance would have been seen in destroying the idol. He promotes God's servants, but you can't earn brownie points with God. Idols must be destroyed. You can't hold on to Christ and idols both. It's impossible. And what we see is, in fact, Nebuchadnezzar is going to relapse. And his relapse is worse. He is more culpable because he is sinning by the minute against more and more light. There's no perseverance. He's full of himself again when we get to chapter 4. He has not repented. And so on the one hand, you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're trusting in God. And there you have, on the other hand, Nebuchadnezzar, who is left in unbelief. Not so much as asking a single question about a mediator. Nothing about how can this God be made my God. And yet in his unbelieving state, he uses his position as magistrate to promote the true religion. That much is commendable. That much is indeed commendable. The fact that he as a magistrate is promoting the true religion Interesting, isn't it? The least offense possible, merely speaking against the Lord, is given the most severe penalty. To so much as speak against him, it's death sentence, and your house is made a dunghill. 
Well, we believe that the magistrate has an obligation to promote the true religion. And we believe that this is an obligation upon every magistrate, and it is a mercy to God's people, even when the, the magistrate may not be converted. If he is in his office upholding the true religion, it's a mercy to God's people. And there is much good accomplished for God's kingdom. And if the magistrate is a Christian, listen to me, the Bible requires that a Christian not only profess Jesus privately, but that the magistrate, a Christian magistrate, is required to also profess Christ publicly in his office. And so the idea of Christian politicians who are private Christians with no civic, corporate, national, public, governmental implications is without biblical, biblical basis. He's obligated to promote the true religion. And it's a mercy. And I'll just mention what I've said before. The greatest reformations in the history of the world, Old Testament, New Testament, post-reformation, reformation, and so on, have been when church and state have worked cooperatively together in seeking to advance God's kingdom and to exalt the glory of Christ as king. And I've multiplied examples of that in the past. What do we see happening to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They're promoted. Think with me. They take a stand in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. At the end of chapter 1, they're promoted. At the end of chapter 2, they're promoted. At the end of chapter 3, promoted. Are you seeing a, a pattern here? The principle is being exemplified. God will honor those who honor him. That principle is being exemplified. God will honor those who honor him. In one, not always in the same manner, but he will do it. They're promoted in the province of Babylon. Well, let's apply this a few more ways and we'll be done. First of all, God is not bound to time limits. One of the things I absolutely love about this passage and that cheers my heart and strengthens my faith is that God is not bound to time limits. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, God is eternal, obviously. God is outside of time. We start there at the being of God. He is outside. He created time. But God is not bound to time limits in this sense. God can bring the most unexpected and extraordinary turn of events in an instant. That does my heart good. It does my heart good to see that God can bring the most unexpected, the most utterly extraordinary turn of events in an instant. Because what happens? We tend to think, first of all, we think to ourselves, we are beyond the point of no return. We look at our circumstances and the, 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 the train wreck, the afflictions that we have, and we think we're beyond the point of no return. We often think that. And it's not true. Then we think, when we have a little more faith, well, if these events are to be turned around, it is a very long, prolonged process in order to get back. There are circumstances in this congregation and in people's lives. And we may think, if it turns, it's going to take a long time. But I'm here this evening to tell you, if God is pleased, he is able to do the most extraordinary, unexpected turn of events in a blink of an eye. This is the God who delivers his people. And he promises that all things will work together for the good of those who love him. It will work together for good for the Christian. Yes, even the burning, fiery furnace will work for the good of those who love the Lord. You remember that behind the fire stands the creator of the fire. The whole universe serves God's plan and glory. I love being a Christian because I can look at absolutely everything around me 
I can look at the entire universe and realize that every molecule and everything, I don't care if it's fire, water, stars, whatever it is, air that we're breathing, the things going on inside my body, chemistry and blood and everything else, every single bit of it serves God and His glory and His plan. And I walk through my entire pilgrimage surrounded with a consciousness that God has at His fingertips everything I see and that it's all serving His end. Yes, and everything I can't see as well. But we also see that God gives grace in our time of need. The God who delivers is faithful, my friends. Those of you who are tempted to be weak in faith, He is faithful. God gives grace in our time of need. He has never sent one single one of His children away. Never sent a child away who needed grace in time of need. He sets the bounds to our affliction and He delivers us just in time. So every affliction we have, He sets the bounds. We don't know. It could be five minutes from now. It could be five years from now. But He has determined when He will deliver us. I love, and I've told perhaps a few of you this week, I've gone back, maybe I've even brought it out in a sermon, but you read the last chapter of Job, and then you read James chapter 5, uh, verse 12, and I'm almost, uh, verse 11, I'm almost done. James 5, 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. And I've preached on this text, as some of you may know. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job. Go back and read the last chapter before you read the next ver words. And have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. My friends, we must love this. We have seen the end of the Lord and that He is full of pity and of tender mercy toward His people. We've seen it in the account that's given by Job. Remember the end. You in the midst of affliction must remember, I have not yet seen the end of the Lord in this matter, but I know that He is full of pity, and that He is full of tender mercy. I know that much. And when I do see the end of the Lord in this matter, it will have manifested the fullness of His pity and of His tender mercy toward me. You can bank on it, my friend. Christian, take heart in these words. This is the God who delivers. And if you are setting out just now as a Christian, if you are just now setting out in your Christian walk, Jesus says that you need to take up your cross, you need to deny yourself, and you need to follow him. This is your life. You must embrace the cross. But know from the onset that a crown is coming. You must wait for that crown. And you must, in some instances, wait long. But taking up your cross, denying yourself, and following Christ will indeed lead to a crown. Because our God does deliver. Let's stand for Almighty God in heaven, grant that our hearts would be brought down low to be able to take in something of the glory that belongs to you as our deliverer. And as has already been prayed this evening, increase our faith. And grant, O Lord, that we might take heart and that we might lean upon our beloved. We ask, O oh God, that you would be pleased to fill our thoughts with your own glory and not with all of the grit of our own lives. 
And we pray, O God, that you would come and encourage and strengthen the hearts of your people this day, that we might go forth with a fresh sight of your splendor. We ask in Jesus' name. Respond to the reading and preaching of God's Word by singing together from Psalm 66. We've sung this a couple times now lately. Psalm 66, verses 8 to 14, the tune is St. Columba, which is tune number 109. We could hardly find more fitting words anywhere, and so we'll sing them again. Verses 8 to 14. Notice verses 12, 13, and 14. Thou hast caused me ride o'er. Thou hast caused men ride o'er our heads, and though that we did pass through fire and water, yet thou broughtst us to a wealthy place. I'll bring burnt offerings into thy house to thee. My vows I'll pay, which my lips uttered, my mouth spake, when trouble on me lay. Verses 8 to 14. Stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.